after removing constitutional protections for motherhood, would have allowed government to spend money on daycare to lure mothers into the workforce. Polling made supporters confident, but they lost by crushing 35 to 48 percent margins at the polls. Abortion-friendly UK doctors want to expand abortion up to birth. Abortion limits were cut to 24 weeks in 1990 to reflect infant survival rates. Viability is now arguably 22 weeks, and pain-capable protections would likely range politically from 12 to 16 weeks. These doctors want roughly 40 weeks or full pregnancy. This is Life News Radio. The view, the accurate view of the human person changes everything. The news you hear and see pertaining to the human person has the power to inform or misinform your opinions and what you do with the gift of life and what you allow your government to do. It's why we at this station offer news on the life issue. We hope you carefully assess what you hear, read, and view. A story at Life News compares economic advantages to lowering either FAA or FDA safety standards. If the Federal Aviation Administration proposed fewer aircraft safety checks, it would be seen as silly. But the Food and Drug Administration does not require ectopic pregnancy or other safety checks before abortion pills. Each is arguably economically advantageous, but each courts disaster. The difference is FDA actions are real and dismiss dangers to women. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On March 15th, we celebrate the feast of St. Longinus, martyr. Longinus was the name of the Roman soldier who, with his spear, henceforth known as the Holy Lance, opened the side of our Lord after he expired on the cross. As John relates in his gospel, out of this final holy wound poured forth blood and water, representing the Eucharist and baptism. Thus, water is mixed with the wine before the consecration at Holy Mass. Cornelius Alapide notes that the miracle took place to show the reality of Christ's human nature and to signify that the church was formed as the spouse of Christ out of the side of the second Adam dying on the cross. The opening itself signified that heaven was opened by his death. Cornelius Alapide also notes that it seems unlikely that this soldier was the same centurion who had just confessed that indeed this man was the Son of God, as mentioned by the other three Gospels. Many traditional accounts, however, maintain that Longinus was indeed that same centurion. Longinus met his martyrdom at Caesarea in Cappadocia, sometime in the first century. He is mentioned on October 16th in the East and in the modern calendar. Also celebrated on this day are St. Aristobulus, one of the original disciples of Christ and a missionary to Britain, St. Lucretia, Pope St. Zachary, St. Clement Mary Hofbauer, St. Louise de Marillac, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. When Jesus arrives at the tomb of Lazarus, Mary, his sister, kneels before Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus was friends with Lazarus and his sisters. When he sees her weeping, he is moved, and the gospel tells us Jesus wept. Those two words are the shortest sentence in the gospels, Jesus wept. We see the human side of Jesus joining in the sadness and loss of his close friends. Lazarus represents each one of us, and we too are called to come out of the tomb of sin and death. The story of Lazarus prefigures the resurrection of Jesus at Easter, but it also points to our baptism. As St. Paul says, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in newness of life. This is Matt Maloney for KnowTheFaith.net. This is Joe McLean, and you're listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of the truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. Go into the world and tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take 
What do you need to know right now? A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. The apocalypse and the signs of the times. The end times, some would say. Uh, we're going to be having a conversation with Simone Delacre coming up at 30 past the hour. I've had him on the show in the past. I'm glad to have him back. We're going to be talking about his incredibly well-produced, I mean, really good quality in times documentary series. It's on the end. It's on the apocalypse. It's in Spanish, but he ha is releasing parts in English as well. We're going to have a conversation about what is this based on? Who is the priest whose interpretations he used uh, to, uh, to, to be the meat and the, the substance of his work on the apocalypse? That's coming up at 30 past the hour. Then we're going to have Sam McCarthy on the team. He's got an article out. Why, what is a Christian nationalist anyway? I mean, in this uh, sort of post-Christendom world we live in where they're tearing down statues and attacking people like St. Hunnipero Sarah, for instance, um, you know, what, what does it mean when you get accused of being a Christian nationalist? He's going to weigh in on that as well. Everything we talk about today will be linked up in the show notes, of course, over at the station of the cross.com forward slash a C T. Hey, do you remember? I mean, like you got to go way back, like way back all the way. I'm talking all the way back to like, say October, you know, just like October of last year. Remember then, remember when Pope Francis said, yeah, ordination, that's only for guys. Okay. So we're going to put an end to this conversation. Ordination's only for guys. Yeah. It was like way back in October, but apparently a lot has changed because He's assigned a group to study the issue of female ordinations and other issues that we would say are, let's say, no bueno. But we'll have maybe a part of that conversation in this hour as well. And I did it. I pulled the trigger. I went and saw Mother Cabrini or Cabrini last night with my wife. And I'll share my thoughts on the film with you at some point, probably in the after show. But nonetheless, a lot to get into today. Share us with a friend, but let's pray and let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint Longinus, pray for us. Longinus was the name of the Roman soldier who, with his spear, henceforth known as the Holy Lance, opened the side of our Lord after he expired on the cross. As John relates in his Gospel, out of this final holy wound poured forth blood and water, representing the Eucharist and baptism. Thus, water is mixed with the wine before the consecration at Holy Mass. Cornelius Alapide notes that the miracle took place to show the reality of Christ's human nature and to signify that the church was formed as the spouse of Christ out of the side of the second Adam dying on the cross. The opening itself signified that heaven was opened by his death. Cornelius Alapide also notes that it seems unlikely that this soldier was the same centurion who had just confessed that indeed this man was the Son of God, as mentioned by the other three Gospels. Many traditional accounts, however, maintain that Longinus was indeed that same centurion. Longinus met his martyrdom at Caesarea in Cappadocia, sometime in the first century. He is mentioned on October 16th in the East and in the modern calendar. For more about this day and others in the church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saints and seasons. Saint Longinus, pray for us. And now your headline news. Just the news reports. Schumer criticizes Netanyahu leadership amid war on Hamas, calls for Israel to hold elections. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on Thursday criticized Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's handling of his country's war on Hamas and called for Israel to hold elections. Schumer said elections are the only way to allow for a healthy and open decision-making process about the future of Israel. 
Israel has been operating under an emergency unity government, a coalition that includes members of Netanyahu's opposition since shortly after the October the 7th attack by Hamas. And Catholic News Agency is reporting the Diocese of Buffalo announces sale of headquarters to pay sex abuse victims. The Diocese of Buffalo, New York, has announced the sale of its headquarters in downtown Buffalo nearly four years after it declared bankruptcy amid hundreds of sexual abuse lawsuits filed against it. The diocese announced this week that the Catholic Center, the Dossison Central Office building since 1986, has been listed for sale for $9.8 million. Dossison officials announced in October of last year that the diocese would be putting forth $100 million to settle the numerous abuse claims lodged against it. Some of those funds would come from the sale of the Buffalo headquarters, as well as the former Christ the King Seminary campus in East Aurora, about 20 miles just outside of the city. Ground News is reporting at least three killed after a tornado touches down in northeastern Indiana. Let's pray for their repose and the recovery of so much damage. And the Vatican is reporting, Pope says, quote, I'm not considering resigning, but would be a Bishop Emeritus of Rome if I did. In an autobiography hitting the bookshelves on March the 19th, the Pope clarified that, that were he to resign, he would not choose to be called Pope Emeritus, but simply Pope Emeritus of Rome, or Bishop Emeritus of Rome, rather. In that case, he would live in the Basilica of St. Mary Major, and not at the Vatican. The Pope clarified that the possible scenario in case of his resignation, but he does emphasize that this is a, quote, distant hypothesis. He says there are no serious reasons to consider this possibility, although I could think of, say, one, two, 12 tops. But anyway, those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from uh, John chapter 7, verses 1 through 2. Verse 10 and 25 through 30. Do you ever wonder why they skip so many? Anyway, Jesus moved about within Galilee. He did not wish to travel to Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. But the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, he himself also went up, not openly, but as it were in secret. Some of the inhabitants of Jerusalem said, is he not the one they are trying to kill? And look, he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Could the authorities have realized that he is the Christ? But we know where he is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. So Jesus cried out in the temple area as he was teaching and said, You know me, and also you know where I am from. Yet I did not come on my own, but the one who sent me, whom you do not know, is true. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So they tried to arrest him, but no one laid a hand upon him because his hour had not yet come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible says the Feast of Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Booths, it is a seven-day fall festival held annually in Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles commemorates both the completion of the autumn harvest and Yahweh's provisions for Israel during the Exodus journey through the wilderness. Throughout the week, Jewish pilgrims dwelled in small huts made from tree branches called booths. Two liturgical ceremonies from this feast hang as a backdrop behind Jesus' teaching in chapters 7 and 8. One, each morning Levitical priests drew water from the Pool of Siloam and uh, in the southern quarter of Jerusalem carried it in procession to the temple and poured it out as a libation next to the altar of sacrifice. This is connected with Jesus' teaching about water in chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Number two, Giant candelabras burned in the sanctuary of the court of women that illuminated the temple courts. At the same time, dancers with flaming torches processed through the temple amid singing and music. This is linked with Jesus' teaching about light in chapter 8, verse 12, which I'm sure you can see very similar scenes like that in many parishes across the world right now. Anyway, the great commentary of Cornelius Lapide would say, when he had said these words, Christ appears not to have taken the straight road through Samaria, 
but to have crossed the Jordan and after dis- dismissing the multitudes to have gone up to Jerusalem with a few of his favored disciples in secret. St. Chrysostom says that on the feast day, they were always disposed to murder and they endeavored to catch him on feast days. And if you say, I'll go to grief. I haven't slept last night. So uh, let's just say saying people's names is going to be difficult for me today. At any rate, uh, admirable work for feast days in making them occasions for murder, quotes Cornelius. And that on the very day they ought to have been searching for Christ in order to believe on him. They were aiming only at his death. Uh, That is such an unsettling thought that on these feast days, they were aiming to capture and to kill him. Why is that? Well, because he made himself equal to God. And on the feast days, especially these particular feast days, like tabernacles, for instance, they all, all the males had to come to Jerusalem. And so they knew he would be there. And yet he was. And yet he was. In spite of the fact that they wanted to kill him, he still showed and he still preached. And he still made himself equal to God. Let's let that sink in today. He is God. Therefore, everything he says has to have an impact on our life. I think this is the great takeaway from these passages this week. He's God. So how does that change your life and the decisions you make? Let's meditate on that. Coming up after the break, Sam McCarthy's on the team. Don't go anywhere. A lot more is coming up next. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non Catholic friend. Many committed Christians hold to this axiom. If it's in the Bible, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, here you go. 1 Timothy 2 states the following about women as related to church life no braiding the hair, no gold jewelry, no pearls. Just learn in silence and do not teach. Does your pastor comply with these biblical instructions? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, an unpleasant fact. Many self proclaimed Bible only churches, sadly, will pick and choose what parts of the Bible are implemented in the life of the church. Secondly, Catholic catechism. Be especially attentive to, quote, the content and unity of the whole scripture. And thirdly, a tough comeback. In order to understand the sacred author's intention, we must take into account culture, audience, and the literary genre. So if your Bible-only church does not strictly obey those instructions, then tell me the reason why. Well, we know, you know, 80% of your church is handled by women. So with those instructions in force, many women will leave your church, maybe even the pastor's wife. Ouch. Atheists claim they don't need God to be a good person, implying God's not relevant to morality. But is this true? Well, atheists can be good in the sense of knowing behaviors that respect the goods of human nature and living accordingly. St. Paul acknowledges this natural moral law in Romans chapter 2. But this doesn't mean God is irrelevant when it comes to morality. And here's the reason. Besides God's grace being necessary to live the moral law perfectly and merit heaven, God is necessary for the law to be morally binding. How can the moral law be binding if there's no moral law giver behind it that surpasses human authority? The answer is, it can't. So an atheist can follow the natural moral law, but only the theist is consistent in saying that such a law is morally obligatory. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is great to be on with you. Coming up at 30 past the hour, Simone Delacroix is going to be on the team. We're going to be talking about his documentary film, on the apocalypse, the apocalypse, the end times, the signs of the times. Boy, are we in them. We're going to have a conversation about what was the motivation behind this film, which is releasing in theaters this year. Um, but I've seen it. It's it's really, really good. And that's coming up at 30 past there. Do join us if you can. Hey, you want some good news? Here's some good news. Hey, Texas has shut off Pornhub. Hey, there's 49 more states to go and some territories. And then there's you, European Union. You, too, can take the great step of shutting off Pornhub and trying to save a few souls from the uh, from utter corruption. So that's good news indeed. Praise be to God. 
Also, good news uh, on the team today. Rejoining us is Sam McCarthy. He's got an article over at Crisis Magazine. What is a Christian nationalist anyway? In a day and an era, talk about the signs of the times where we live in a post-Christendom, a post-Christian era where people like Hanipero Serra, who who walked thousands and thousands of miles with a limp, defending Native American populations against, uh, you know, corrupt sol- uh, conquistador soldiers. Nonetheless, his statue gets t- torn down, um, but uh, others, you know, the wokeism gets to stay. Uh, Sam McCarthy, welcome to the team. Thanks for being on the show again today. I, I re- enjoyed your article, What is a Christian Nationalist? Anyway, let's start with that. Let's define terms. So what is a Christian Nationalist? Well, thanks for having me on the show, Joe. It's really good to be talking to you again. I think that uh, Christian nationalists, you know, there's different people will offer their different definitions. I mentioned in the article, a Politico author who offered her very leftist uh, definition, which is almost, it's been billed as kind of a scare tactic. Uh, But I think that she, she did, to a certain extent, kind of hit the nail on the head when she said that Christian nationalists are people who believe that the nation was founded on Christian principles and believe that those principles should be lived out in public life and governance. I think that really at the end of the day, that's that's the best definition. You know, I quote uh, John Adams in there who said that uh, our system of government, the American government, was really only made for a moral and religious people. And Christian nationalists are simply trying to both in, you know, their private personal lives, their public lives and in the voting booth live out those religious and moral principles uh, so that our system of government can continue to work. That's really what it's built upon and what it rests upon. It requires a, a high degree of discipline, of moral rigor and of, uh, of strong moral character. You know, a great deal of responsibility is required by our form of government. And without that taking responsibility for it, if we expect the government to take responsibility for us rather than us taking responsibility for it, then it's going to collapse. It's going to fall apart. Mm. You know, it's fascinating to me uh, just talking about John Adams and and the founding fathers of of America as as they become more ingrained in my Catholic faith, I, I feel a little bit more separated from George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, and all the rest, they were deists for the most part. John Adams himself, I mean, basically, he was a deist. He's the, I would say he's the he's the grandfather, the godfather, of, if you will, of our American legal system. We wouldn't have the, the kind of American legal system we do today if it wasn't for John Adams. He's a fascinating and intriguing character, to say the least. But what about their deism versus our Catholicism? Can, you know, do we do, how, how on, on the same page are we with the Founding Fathers? And then how does that play a role in this conversation today about Christian nationalism? I think that's a really good question. I think that one of the, one of the key things that our American Founding Fathers did that really was revolutionary, that nobody had done, nobody had tried up until that point, was they formed a system of government that really handed responsibility for governance to the people themselves, to us. And that really that that requires, as I just noted, you know, it requires a very high degree of moral rigor, of moral discipline, of intellect, insight, wisdom, self-knowledge, and the capacity or the ability to kind of shape culture, to become yourself a leader, to lead others and to inspire and to sort of educate others to lead themselves. So I think that really it's it's a very adult form of government. And I think that it, it can be properly used by anybody who has, you know, strong moral values, rigor, discipline, et cetera. For example, Catholics, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, we kind of, I don't want to say we have a monopoly on moral discipline and, and rigor, you know, with asceticism and our, our scapulars and hair shirts and such. But I'd say we may, we may have a controlling interest. Um, so I, it's certainly applicable and usable by Catholics. Uh, I don't think that the our legal system necessarily takes into account um, the, the particular colors or shades of various Christian faiths. But I do believe that it was founded on Christian principles, and it, it was designed for, it's in some sense, an adult population, you know, people who were 
like I said, able and willing to take responsibility for themselves, their moral state, their moral character. Um, so I, I think that that's really the way that it was designed and the way that it will best I, function. I guess the reason why it even comes to mind, um, and I know your article is not necessarily about this, but at the same time, it kind of comes to my mind because the country was founded by, as we said, deists, Protestants, Puritans. They they were the majority, and they got to decide how things worked. In fact, you know, Protestants from Delaware invaded Maryland and killed uh, Catholics, and some of those Catholics had to flee for their lives, and they went across that border down into Maryland, and they ran into trouble there. So Catholics have always been a bit on the ropes. In fact, uh, I'm going through the book of Dagger John right now about Archbishop Hughes in New York, who had to fight the party the Know Nothings during the uh, during the American uh, the Civil War. So, you know, it's always been a contentious issue about Catholics versus Protestants in our country. And what's interesting and how it ties back into kind of your article here is uh, as we've seen this centuries uh, go by now in, in America, the evangelical, the, the more Protestant uh, domination of things has, has, has gone down. Catholicism, in fact, the numbers are up in, a, in the country. We see more Catholics in power and in, in, uh, positions of, you know, political power, etc. So it's an interesting time that we live in, and yet it's also a post-Christendom time. So in some ways, the commentators, like the one you quote here uh, in your article, it's like they're, they're, they're moving from an anti-Catholic position as a Protestant to an anti-Christian position as a, as a, re, as a renewed retro-pagan, essentially. And I think they never did have the plot to the story to begin with. I mean, isn't that part of the part of this issue as well? It's like the, the, it's sort of a it's an imperfect criticism to begin with. Yeah, I, I think that that's fair. I would certainly agree with with that particular assessment. I think that what you see right now is, you know, and what you've seen throughout history, really, Joe, is Catholics have been leaders, especially among Christians. Catholics have been leaders, founders. We've been the, the great missionaries, you know, to, to Japan, to the New World. You know, uh, you think of not today's order, but the old Jesuit order, you know, and how they evangelized much of, you know, the Western world. You know, you, we've, we have been the leaders, and we also in America. I wrote an article on the uh, anniversary of the fall of Roe v. Wade. It's really Catholics who let, founded, started, led the pro-life movement. It was predominantly Catholics who were responsible for, on the Supreme Court, bringing down Roe v. Wade. So we, we've we always had this, I don't want to say elite position, but we've always had a unique position amongst principles and conservative, conservatism, sorry, in the United States. And so I, th I think that it, this critique of Christian nationalism offered by people like Heidi Persbola, uh, this critique, like you note, it, starts as maybe an anti-Catholic position, but it, really it's rooted in uh, leftism. It's rooted in this progressivism. It's rooted in this idea that people like C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, and J.R.R. Tolkien all foresaw and predicted, you know, a hundred years ago that this ideology would come about, this, this rampant, degenerate progressivism that would simply rely solely on the idea of I want. And that's why it's opposed to all Christianity is because all Christianity, whether Catholicism or not, does ultimately say we have to cede to Christ. We have to submit to Christ, take his yoke upon us. And the leftist impulse is to break the yoke. Mm. So uh, I like what you said here. This is the end result of leftism, the good that is that it worships, complete, unbridled, abandoned to self. This is also why Christian nationalism poses such a threat, indeed an existential threat to leftism, as you just said, because Christianity is dedicated to complete unbridled abandonment of self to Christ, where leftism declares every man can be God, can be a God. Christianity teaches that every man ought to be a slave to Christ. The catch, of course, is that by being slaves to Christ, we also become sons of God, Galatians 4, 7. So this is very well said, but I guess the, the thought that comes to my mind now then, of course, is, yeah, but, I mean, I, 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 trains left the station, Sam. I mean, it seems like it seems like there's no turning back now. I don't see this country uh, sort of recouping it, its lost, you know, some might say the glory days. I don't know. I'd characterize it that way, but I don't see 
a, a coming together and in re-embracing the Christian ideal any longer. We, we live in a, in a post-Christian world. So this criticism levied against us, using the term Christian nationalist as a, as a derogatory term to insult us, that's only going to get worse. But, you know, maybe we just grow thick skin here and just try to remain in a state of grace. Well, I think really what what we end up looking at, you know, C.S. Lewis in his book, That Hideous Strength, which is an apocalyptic novel, it's kind of about the end of the world, he has this cabal of villains who are, they're bureaucrats, scientists, uh, politicians, lawyers, etc. And they're in contact essentially with demons who they mistake for aliens. They believe that they're these life forms from outer space or whatever. And they, they end up violating a rule uh, established by God, where they end up actually bringing their own destruction down upon themselves. And I think that we're witnessing that. The entire leftist ideology and its its sacraments, if you will, uh, because leftism is a religion in its own right, uh, but the entire leftist religion and faith and its sacraments, such as you know transgenderism, contraception, abortion, they're suicidal. We, yeah. Whereas the Christian, the Christian faith promotes and and integralizes family, recognizes and upholds the good of family. So in the end, as desperate and hopeless as things seem, in a few generations, there's going to be fewer and fewer of them. You know, sterilized people can't reproduce. You know, they can groom, but they can't reproduce. We can reproduce in tremendous numbers. So I think yeah. that they, there is there is great hope. In that regard, uh, Charles Colomb said on X just this morning, he says the problem with vandalizing statues and artworks is that the vandalizers do so presuming that there will be no response in kind. They had better hope they are right. Of course, such a response unra- unravels the social fabric further. But that is the fault of the authorities. And I guess to the victor go the spoils. So as that pendulum swings goes around comes around i think there's something to that too hey sam mccarthy i enjoyed your article thank you for sharing it with us and having a conversation today what is a christian nationalist anyway it's over at crisismagazine.com we're going to link to it in the show notes for you over at the station of the cross.com forward slash act producer jake we'll get the show notes up at the top of the hour sam mccarthy god bless you god love you look forward to having you back soon thanks joe thanks for having me on Coming up after the break, more breaking news and stories. And then let's talk about the apocalypse, the sign of the times. We're living in them. We're seeing it. I think so anyway. We'll get your take and more coming up next. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Father Jim Netto with the Diocese of Portland, Maine. In Krakow, Poland, on the 2nd of June, 1938, the Lord Jesus himself directed a young Polish Sister of Mercy on a three-day retreat. Sister Faustina painstakingly recorded Christ's instructions in her diary, that is, a mystical manual on prayer and divine mercy. These instructions became Faustina's weapon in fighting the good fight. Jesus began, My daughter, I want to teach you about spiritual warfare. Secret number 12. If someone causes you trouble, think of what good you can do for the person who caused you to suffer. In this secret, Jesus reminds us that being a vessel of divine mercy is a weapon for good and for defeating evil. The devil is about hatred, rage, revenge, and unforgiveness. Others have hurt us at different times. What good can we do in return? Returning a blessing breaks curses. We must not allow charity to suffer as a result of what others have done to us. Penance is, in any case, to be judged more by what it gains than what it renounces. If Christ is the way, we Christians are on the way. We are followers, moreover, in cross-bearing. We come behind him. Identification with Christ's passion is an idea that the mind can grasp. Thus, in the wounds others place upon us, we can find our trust for eternal life. Our wounds can become our merits. The identification is with Christ and his cross. 
may we always take advantage of the crosses sent to us. And from them, may we bring light into darkness and ultimately life into death. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. The AP is reporting SpaceX comes close to completing its test flight of the mega rocket, but loses spacecraft near the end. The nearly 400-foot Starship, the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built, reached an altitude of about 145 miles yesterday. But 49 minutes into the flight, with just 15 minutes to go, all contact was lost, and the spacecraft presumably broke apart. Two test flights last year both ended in explosions just minutes after liftoff. But by surviving for close to 50 minutes this time, yesterday's effort was considered a win by Elon Musk and NASA. The agency is counting on the Starship to take astronauts to the moon in just a few years. Breitbart reports Commission agrees to creation of database to trace all guns in the European Union. A commission drawn from the European Parliament and Council has agreed on the creation of a database to track millions of guns believed to be in civil hands across the European Union. Upwards of 35 million firearms are believed to be privately held and tracking those guns is being presented as a way of fighting gang violence and terrorism. The database follows a 2022 move to switch from paper records in gun stores to electronic records, the latter of which can now be rolled into a centralized list. 35 million guns. Come to Texas. We got more than that. Hey, uh, the French president, Macron, is uh, he's also doubling down on whether or not to send troops to the Ukraine. In an interview the French national, on French national television just yesterday, President Emmanuel Macron was asked about the prospect of sending Western troops to Ukraine, which he publicly raised last month in comments that prompted pushback from other European leaders who stressed that they had no plans to do so. Macron, who is the commander-in-chief of the country's armed forces, declined to say in which situation France would be ready to send those troops, but said that he would do so to ensure U Ukraine's victory if necessary. We're getting that much closer. World War III right there. Those, those are your headline news. Hey, praise be to God. Hey, if you have a will, do you have a will? If you got a will, then uh, let me just encourage you to uh, check out mycatholicwill.com anyway, mycatholicwill.com forward slash ACT, or forgive me, mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross, mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. You can get one for free uh, with referral code 14 stations. They are generously supporting our cause. And if you, if you could maybe leave us in your will, that'd be an amazing thing. But if you haven't done so, let me just encourage you to go to caravelfilms.com. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes for you. But uh, I, I, I had, I had Simone on the team at the end of last year, and I wanted to get him back because it's such a great film. It is in Spanish, but he's been releasing parts in English as well, and there are English subtitles. And it is definitely worth your time. The quality is so very good, and it goes through the entire book of the Apocalypse and provides not just a sort of a blow by blow, but it actually does some interpretation as well. And it is again. So Super high quality. So let me just encourage you to go to caravelfilms.com. But Simone De, uh, Delcari joins us now from Caravel. Good morning to you, Simone. Thank you for your time today. Good morning, Joe. Thank you for inviting me again to your show. Appreciate having you on the team. Let's talk about your film again um, and take us through this because, again, just the quality is so very good. And, you know, as an English speaker, I can get past the fact that it's not in English and I can read subtitles. I think it's easy because the rest of it is just so gripping and engaging and so well done. So when did you uh, film this? When did you produce this? What motivated you to do that? Well, I was a big fan of Hollywood ap apocalyptic movies like Zombie Apocalypse and The Meteor that was to go into Destroy the Earth, that kind of movie. I was a big fan of them when I was young, younger, <laughs> not that Amen, old. Yeah. Um, but j just because that, that I was very curious as a Catholic, what did the real apocalypse say? 
but I think it was more like um, insane curiosity, curiosity. So I went to the book of Apocalypse, I read it, and it was very bizarre for me. I didn't understand much, too, ma too many <laughs> symbols. I didn't know how to inter interpret them. So um, I left this aside and forgot about it. And then yeah. I found out of um, a writer in Argentina, I didn't know, uh, who was called Leonardo Castellani, who was a priest. He was uh, a journalist also, and he was um, also a, a, a doctor in theology and philosophy. And he studied all his life the apocalypse, and he wrote a book about the apocalypse, the interpretation of the apocalypse at the light, in the light of tradition. He gathered all he could read all his life from the whole of the, the fathers of the church to his days. And he wrote this book that um, embraces all that and puts it all in order and cleans it up from heretic uh, views about it. And uh, because he, he read everything, he also read uh, Protestant books about it um, and, and what the Protestants said about the apocalypse. And he made like a cleanup of all that and made this uh, book that is called The Apocalypse of St. John. And when I read it, I was shocked by how current it was yeah. and, and how it applied to us, to our day. So I started to be more interested in the real apocalypse than the Hollywood apocalypse. And that, that, that way came the idea of making a film about it. I study film at film school here in, in Argentina. Um, so, but I never, never practice it. I never practice it because as a Catholic, uh, the ambience there and the, the world of cinema in Argentina is uh, very bad and corrupted. And there's nothing you can do if you, if you don't do it by yourself, uh, you, you'll end up in a bad place probably. So wow. I never practice it. And when the, the, uh, COVID-19 came up and the lockdowns, I lost my job. I had a lot of time in my hands. So I started this project that I was caressing for, for a long time. And that's how it started. And we filmed it here in Argentina during lockdowns, most of it. And we've been filming for the last uh, three years. And uh, thanks God, it, it started as a YouTube series, but it turned out to, into a movie, and it is releasing in theaters this year soon. That's exciting. So Praise be to God. Now, Congratulations. Working, yeah, thank you. We're working it, on, on having also an English version. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask that question. With, yeah. with audio, not only subtitles. Is it is it going to be possible to see uh, a theatrical release in the United States for the film, even on a limited run? Well, we, we, we are working on that for the Spanish version. In the United States, you have the, the Spanish public, uh, public and the English public. They work like in a parallel way and, and we can release in Spanish. And then if we manage to have a good version in English, release in English. Also, we need a lot of support from Americans to start knowing the project. And, and in Spanish, it's easier because uh, we do have a lot of support from uh, big influencers, big uh, and known priests, good priests, yeah. and also bishops. We even have uh, the support from Bishop Schneider. I, I don't know if you saw on the web, we that, have a yeah. video of Bishop Schneider who, who knows about the film and and he recommends it. And, but we still need support from uh, big mm -hmm. weights there in America too, because yeah. maybe we could, we could get, the, get the theaters, but we then have to fill them. So yeah. So that's the hard part. The theaters, and you don't fill them, you lose, end up losing a lot of money that we don't have. So uh, we're yeah. working on that. Now, just, I think, was it yesterday, the day before we, you know, marked 11 years of the current Pope, who's from Argentina, uh, Pope Francis. And I got to be honest with you, it's not been in a good 11 years for Holy Mother Church in many ways. And uh, it's kind of sad to say for for, for the, our first Argentinian pontiff. But I don't know how you feel about it. But I guess my bigger point is there are many Catholics today 
who are asking themselves, are we looking at the end times? Are we in these last days? Will we see the second coming of Christ soon? Three days of darkness and the great chastisement and and uh, the enlightenment. I mean, the pe- Catholics are asking these questions. They're seeing Fiducia Supicons alone has created a worldwide uh, pushback. I mean, bishops and priests and faithful all over the planet. The Coptics are like, we don't want to even talk to the to the to the Vatican right now because the Fiducia Supicons alone. And uh, Pope Francis, uh, he doubles and triples down on on a lot of these things, and it's created such a firestorm. We see the world around us not becoming more holy, not becoming more virtuous, not embracing the Catholic faith. We see quite the opposite, actually. That we I just talked to the last guest about a post Christendom. Era. So in your work, and, and especially with uh, with Father Leonardo Castianelli, um, what was the sense of the timing uh, of these end times events? Do you personally believe that we are near the end? And what did Father Leonardo believe? Well, let me start with Father Leonardo Castellani, who lived, who wrote the book in the 1960s. And he believed um, we were really close in that time. He could see mm-hmm. modernism in the church and in the Jesuits. He was a Jesuit and he was a really a very hard persecuted for, for criticizing and, and calling off a modernism inside the church. And he was even suspended as a priest for 10 years Wow! for, for that reason. And he was, uh, I, I, I think I told you last time, he was even uh, locked into a madhouse for several years until he escaped. Wow, he was very persecuted, and and that wow. from the the Jesuits. So it doesn't surprise us that the the actual the current uh, pope is a Jesuit also. Uh, so he he was denouncing this from the Jesuits since 1960 or before even. Wow. And yeah. so yeah, he thought uh, the times were near. He actually said it in a conference uh, that. He said, I'm very old, I won't see it, but you or your sons probably will, he said, the second, uh, talking about the second coming. And mm. I believe it's so, I believe it's so. There are many things, even more in our time than in his time, in the 60s when he wrote. Today, um, you read his book and it's even more current than in the time it was written. So not only the things you mentioned about uh, the crisis in the church is a big sign but also the crisis in the world and this like the um, the 2030 agenda uh, it, it all like so many pieces that uh, they, they go together so well showing that we are in the end times and mm. the the world is sick as never we are the world went back to paganism uh, a paganism that is way worse than roman paganism because mm. Romans didn't know better, but we do. We we had Christianity, and today's paganism is also apostasy. So it's way worse. And the the crisis in the in the church is similar to the crisis in the church on the first coming. The church, I mean, the the synagogue on the first coming. And Father Castellani, Castellani says that Jesus, the world. Uh, will be the same way in, in, an analog, in an analog way, will be similar to the first coming. So mm. we have paganism again, ruling the world, and we have Phariseeism again in the, in the church, no? Phariseeism in the, yeah. in the sense of a church that doesn't care about God or, or truth, and all they want to be is uh, sleep with the world. Mm. We're having a conversation with Simone uh, Delacre from Caraville Films, and we're just about, we're going to be up against a break here. But can I just encourage you to check out the, the trailer and maybe share it and support it if you can, because it would be great to see uh, the, we need a community that supports Catholic filmmakers. And uh, Simone has done a really high-end job here. I mean, you put a lot of effort into this, you can tell. Production values are very, very good, uh, and even if you can't, uh, even if you can't listen to it in English, and there is a, an episode, there is a chunk of it in English that's also excellent. I think you can you can pay to get access to that as well. Go to carabellfilms.com and you can see it for yourself. You can share it with friends as well. But wouldn't it be amazing if we could support Simone in an opportunity to maybe get this out in theaters all around the world? 
because in these difficult and dark days that we live in, I think it's now is more important than ever for us to come together as a faithful community, live in a state of grace, pursue virtue. But we got to spread those seeds as far and as wide as possible. The clock is ticking. The time of mercy is coming to an end. The time of judgment will be upon us. And golly gee whiz, wouldn't we want to save our neighbor? One of the greatest things you could do during Lent, and this is hard, especially today, if it's possible to go to daily mass where you have a church close to you, you can do that, do it. Or if, if you can't make daily mass, just read the gospel of the day or the readings for the day and then use that in your mental prayer. Of course, the family rosary, and I mean the family rosary, crying together, I don't believe it's an option no more. You really want to save your souls, you want your children to save their souls, you better be praying the rosary. Now, Our Lady gives us the great promises that rosaries will end wars, will end famines. And it does, and it did. And so that means it will end the wars in your own families. It will end the wars in your marriages. And end the wars with, you know, people that you work with and so on. So this is a beautiful thing, but to pray the rosary, and the rosary too, when you do it, to do it, you know, if you pray the rosary, you will become a saint. That's Sermons for Everyday Living from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. Ask a Priest Live, weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. We'll bring you a different priest each weekday where you can participate in a live Q&A on the topics that matter. To get your question in for Father, call 1-877-511-5483 while the show is live. Email us anytime at priests at thestationofthecross.com or visit our show page at thestationofthecross.com slash askapriest. Hear a powerful sermon you need to share with a loved one? Maybe there's a guest, prayer, or teaching segment that deserves another listen. You can listen to any of our network-produced programs at your convenience by finding us wherever you enjoy podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and the free iCatholic Radio app. Be uplifted in your faith. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on your favorite podcasting platform. Speed of Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take a Bold Synthesis of Information and Inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. A, uh, we're having a conversation here with Simone Delacre from Caravel Films. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes, but you can go to caravelfilms.com or to the film itself, Apocalypse. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to it because I'll get it wrong if I say it incorrectly. So just caravelfilms.com is the best place to go. But we're going to put a link to everything in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Show notes will be up soon. But if you're on the insider email list, don't forget we're doing our trustful surrender to divine providence this Lent. So today's the day where I'm going to be releasing that. I'll send out an email for you as well. And then I'm also going to be releasing my video on the uh, the. Uh, the Catholic Relief Services scandal, all of my interviews that I did in Virginia last week. So make sure to be on the insider email list as well. Go to the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Simone, welcome back to the show. Thank you again for your time today. What was the hardest part of producing this film? I mean, there a, a lot went into this. I'm guessing it was the post-production effort because there was so much CG, but it looked really good, by the way. Well, everything was difficult for me because I lacked the experience. And as I, as I told you before, I didn't practice. Uh, I studied, but I never practiced for about 20 years. So everything was wow. learning on the go and everything was hard. But as, as soon as, thanks God, the apocalypse, it, it has like a learning curve itself. You start with letters to the seven churches. So we only had to film an old man representing St. John writing letters. Then we had the four, four horsemen of the apocalypse. That was even harder, uh, but we made it. And then we have the seven trumpets, and there goes a lot of visual effects and CGI. Um, so it was all learning on the way. So it was all very, very hard yeah. for us. And that's why maybe it took so long. We took, it's about four years work on it and wow. for a two hour, long movie now or three yeah. episodes in the uh, series version and but yeah everything was very hard 
Um, new technologies help a lot and make it a lot uh, cheaper to do, but yet it was very, very hard. Well, hats off to you. Again, you did a beautiful job, but okay, I produced a documentary film on the end times at the end of uh, December. I released it uh, mid-December and I flew to Rome and I filmed in Rome and I filmed in New York and and all over. And um, one of the things that I did on my filming journey was just really think about what people are thinking about right now. Again, they're struggling with these end times, you know, anxieties really. And um, and I wanted to meet that head on. So we I did a, a full interview with Joshua Charles, who's been a fantastic exegete. And uh, he we talked. I even looked at Taylor Marshall's work, and I found Taylor Marshall's book on the apocalypse, on the Revelation, is very similar to Father Castellani's take. It seems like there's a, yeah, a lot of parallels there. Uh, Taylor Marshall, Taylor Marshall follows Cole Hauser, exactly. And Father yeah. Castellani also. Uh, yeah. The thing, the difference is that Taylor Marshall. Uh, repeats Holhauser uh, in the whole and as it is. So Holhauser, he wrote, I don't remember, I think he wrote in like 14th century or 16th century, a long time ago. So Father Cast and, and he, in the interpretation he does, um, he sees everything from his time. He didn't see our times as Father Castellani did. So Father yeah. Castellani, one thing that he does is take Holhauser and um, and updated him, like if yeah. Hauser talks about the, the the this idea of the churches being epochs of the the churches, the seven churches being epochs of the church comes from Holhauser, and Castellani mm. takes it and he says, okay, Holhauser saw um, the, that the first church was uh, the, the 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 early Christians, the second church, Smyrna, Smyrna was the um, the persecutions of the Romans, and that Holhauser saw it, but until he reaches his time, Holhauser uh, couldn't see forward in time, so he was lost when he got to the the, the last churches. There, yeah. Castellani, what he makes is he says, "Okay, Holhauser uh, got it right until here, but because he couldn't see the rest of the story, like he couldn't see the French Revolution, he couldn't mm. see modernism, he couldn't see." Uh, I don't know, the end of Christian of Christendom. So uh, what Castellani does is update the seven churches following Holhauser. So that's yeah. why uh, you, you can see a lot of similarities in Taylor Marshall's interpretation. I, one of the things that I discovered was a, for a lot of Catholics, they think the book of the apocalypse is just too scary. Uh, there's, there's, there's beasts, you know, there's, there's, destruction there's plagues there's pestilences there's judgment so i think a lot of catholics will avoid the book of the apocalypse uh they'll maybe yeah, even that, avoid that, like a movie like yours because it brings on those anxieties what would you say to that why would why should the average catholic watch your film um in well, spite of the, the book, anxieties yeah the book of apocalypse uh, above all is a book of hope is the book that uh, brings the last good news, that is the second coming. Also, it starts, it's the only book in the Bible, the only book in the Bible that has a blessing for the one who reads it. It's the, actually the book of Revelation starts, blessed uh, those who read and hear uh, the yeah. prophecy from this book. So that's, that's on the book. And there's no, no other book on the Bible that promises a, a blessing just for reading it. So I, I think everyone should read it. And all these um, calamities we see on, on the book of Revelation, they are there, that's true. It has its scary part, if you will. Uh, but everything is um, targeting the second coming. So everything bad you may read on the, or scary you may read on the, on the book of Revelation, it, it's always going to the second coming and it's always having that happy ending. Yeah. So I yeah. think no one should be scared. And most of the scary parts are for sinners. And, and they are like warnings for sinners and, mm. and, and not for, for, for all, all people. The, there's yeah. going to be a persecution. And that is said on the, on the book of the Apocalypse, as is said in Matthew 24 by our Lord. But... Every, every time the, the accent is put in the second coming, 
every time a calamity is announced. Mm. We're going to run out of time here very quickly. Uh, what, what do you think, what, how much do you need in order to like get the English version done? And then what would it take to get that released in the United States? Like, what is the need? What can people help you with? Well, for starters, uh, we need to dab it properly and that costs some money. Then we have to produce, we only have half of the book of the apocalypse and we have to produce the other half for the second part movie. And that is uh, $1,008,000. Wow. One million and wow. Yeah, the second part has a lot of CGI and it, it we get into a kind of CGI that I won't be able to do as I've been doing now, like on the go and learning as I do. Uh, we have the the visions of the dragon of seven heads and the yeah. beast of seven heads, the beast from Earth. We have battles from angels in 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 the sky, battling um, demons in the yeah. sky. Also, we have very epic scenes that come out just from the apocalypse, and just it's way over our, our heads now. Yeah. First part yeah. was it's it's of the book of the apocalypse. It's a lot simpler in terms of visions and easier to produce but the second part is way over our heads are you going to launch a like a gibson go or a kickstarter type of campaign or try to raise those funds um we started uh just launch um, a, a, a campaign on life site on life okay. founder from life site okay and there you it's life uh, i think it's called end times the campaign Send us a link. We'll put it in the show notes. Send us a link to that. We'll include it in the show notes so that uh, we can share that with our audience. But uh, Simone Delacre from Caravel Films, God bless you, my friend. I am grateful that you were able to come back onto the show today. Caravelfilms.com was where you can check it out, watch the trailer, get more information, and even support them, too. All there at caravelfilms.com. Simone, God bless you. God love you. Have a great day, my friend. You, too. Anthony Stein will be up on Monday, so we'll see you there or in the after show. God love you. So what did you think of today's show? Let's discuss that right now in the after show. Your take on the aftertake. Comment. Interact live with me and the team. All you need to do is search for one of our live video feeds on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, LinkedIn, and elsewhere. Simply search for The Station of the Cross, Joe McLean, or A Catholic Take. I'm looking forward to seeing you and interacting with you directly. It all starts right now. It's The After Show. And we're back. Welcome to The After Show, everyone. And if you can believe it, it is Friday once again. We have survived the week. But only, have, have we? <laughs> but only barely. Only uh, barely. So, uh, good news, bad news. Good news, bad news. Good news, bad news. Um, what do you want to hear first? What do you like? The good news, so we can go into the weekend with the bad news. The bad news <laughs> is I didn't sleep last night. Uh, the good news is I got to go watch uh, Cabrini with my wife. It was a fun day night. It was great. So uh, I have opinions now that are, I'm going to argue, qualified. They're qualified. They're qualified opinions because I have seen the film. You know, just like, uh, just like the great philosopher, the Catholic philosopher, theologian once said, Nancy Pelosi, you got to pass this to know what's in it. Okay. <laughs> so I passed it and now I know what's in it. So I have qualified opinions. Um, but uh, I want to tell you about that. Let you know how I felt. I felt about having watched the film, but I didn't sleep at all last night because I have allergies and surviving the show. Is, I'm surprised I didn't do worse. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought for sure that's going to be a little bit more bumpy of a ride. You remember this? Did you guys see that video of like those airplanes doing 800 miles an hour? <laughs> they got caught in some crazy jet stream insanity and they were like the and they were like do 800 miles an hour everybody's like freaking out i thought like it was gonna be like that it wasn't as bad as i thought though hey laura l good morning to you karen any bashaw trad jack burton tweed in toe is on the team today mike k jen nugent james 16897 good morning to you glad to see you here paul our friend from buffalo is on the team 
Damon, of course, glad to see you here. Eileen, good morning to you. Uh, Karen, Andy Bashaw, glad to see you guys here. Thanks for chatting it up with us this morning on the back end. Hopefully you guys are having a great day today. Um, I see Master Baker's in the house. Good morning to you. Colin, good morning to you. Helen O'Connor, Walter, good morning to you, Walter. I will be praying for the repose of the soul of Joseph, Cardinal Cordis, who died earlier today at the age of 89, a German. I will be praying for his repose. Be assured of my prayers. I will include them in our our uh, rosary tonight as a family as well. Carl, good morning to you. Alberto, Don, the Highlanders back on the team. I haven't seen you in the chat box in a while. Don, glad to see you back. Thanks for hanging out with us. Alberto, our friend from the UK. Angel Knight is here. Uh, Kilroy Jones, Anthony, good morning to you. Helen, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Lights is 10. Michael, good morning to you. Glad to see everybody here today. Carl Thomas, did I mention you, Carl? Welcome to the team. Miriam. Miriam, Chesty Marine, KSW. Shaquille, good morning to you, Shaquille. Any relation to O'Neill? Just asking for a friend. Um, do, 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 scrolling backwards. Oh, can you hear my nasally voice? It's horrible. Colleen, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Evelyn, good morning to you. Troy Lockett, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Gregory, Gregory was here earlier. I think he had to go to Mass, if I remember correctly. Gabrielle, good morning to you, Gabrielle. Glad you're here. Thanks for commenting. Appreciate you doing it. I see uh, Donald Paddock here. Look at you, Jake. You and, uh, what's it, John Gangsta Pose on the break oh, picture? Yeah. <laughs> Were you busting out gangster poses? I think I think he's talking about the uh, the landing page. Were you you and were, me back? You, to, you and me back. Were to you back. doing? Were you doing like? Yeah. I don't know how. I don't uh, know how to do. I don't know how to do all that. Uh, but were you doing like secret Freemason gang signs uh, or something? I, if I told you, Joe, I'd have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, technically, according to the oath you swear as yeah. a Freemason, you're 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 saying you're going to kill yourself. Yeah. Like you yes, exactly. Super yeah. coups. Yes. <laughs> Torn and Twain. <laughs> Sudoku? Yes, I'd have to commit, Whatever. Have to commit what, Sudoku. No. Whatever, bro. Irregardless of how it's actually said. Yeah, in I wonder, spite guys, of all of think, that. Don't tell Joe, but do you think I can convince him that it's actually Sudoku and not Seppuku? So that he can Isn't embarrass- Sudoku like a game? Yeah, Isn't it like, is. like a game? <laughs> <laughs> That's that numbers game. I, well, I don't know. What do I've, I, what do I've I know? Like, tried to play it. I don't, I don't think I, I've... It messes with my head. I like, I like, <laughs> I like crosswords. I don't like crosswords. I'm not smart enough for that stuff. Good grief. Like it's Scrabble. Use, useless I, trivia. Useless trivia. Like that's, that's. I don't even know how to spell. That's all that's in my brain. So, Patty, good morning to you. Lori, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Glad you guys are here today. Thanks for doing it. Jane. Jane wants some recommendations. All right. It's your turn. Do you have recommendations for Jane? Jane says, any good books on, on Charles Borromeo? Just watched a YouTube video of a priest that mentions him while talking about priests. And bishops no longer teaching the faith. Charles Borromeo is what what the kids call a Chad, an uh, an Uber Chad. Can we say Uber Chad? He is based no cap lit. Uh, well, I don't even. I, I got to get a dictionary with all the current terms because the ones I'm using are at least five years old now, so they're probably totally out of date. Mm-hmm. But but uh, Charles Borromeo was an Uber Chad when he showed up to his diocese. He had to create two seminaries, one just for um, just for the existing priests because they needed to be catechized. They were not wearing clerics. They're carrying swords, cavorting with ladies. And then um, then he had to set up a second seminary just for new seminarians, for, you know, potential vocations. And he did so. During the Black Plague, you know, unlike, say, in modern pandemics where they just shut the mass off, Charles Borromeo was like, oh, heck no. Hold my beer. Watch this. And he still holds mass. Still gives communion to those that are stricken with the plague, by the way. <laughs> like he he still, he still, you know, makes it happen. Because where there's a will, there is a way. I can't prove this, but uh, Charles Borromeo may be the granddaddy of all U.S. Marines. You know? <laughs> Adapt, overcome, <laughs> improvise. You know, get her done. Like... It's a lost art within the hierarchy these days, it would seem. But nonetheless, Charles Borromeo. So if you got a book on Charles Borromeo that you would like to recommend to uh, to Miss Jane, that would be amazing. 
That'd be amazing. Let, let put the put the title of it in the in the com box and let us know what you're thinking. Hey, I see Sci-Fi Mike over on Rumble. I also see Honey West 25. Good morning to you. Joe question is a natural what? Oh no. Queer certain is a natural antihistamine. I got to look that up. Where's I got to look it up. I, I, it's so far away and the words are tiny. Yeah, in my defense, I'm old. So, okay? I don't have like I have I have like glasses everywhere. Maybe I maybe I should just double up here. I'll, I'll put Whoa, it in no, the uh, I'll put it in the. That bench, made it worse. Yeah. Sure. Okay, thanks. Because I I, I, get, I don't know what it is, but my mom told me to take it, so I take it. So <laughs> you're a good son. Your mom told you to do it, so you do it. Hey, Nick, the mic. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, hey, Casey Tart is back. Bonjour, bonjour. But speaking of bonjour, how do you feel about uh, Manuel Emmanuel Macron Macron Macron? Macron. Macron. French, the French language is like river stones. You know, it's rocks that have been smoothed over. You just take all the syllables and you just blend them. That's kind of how I see French. Uh, At any rate, rabbit holes aside, how do you feel about French troops in Ukraine? Because he's threatening to send them. I mean, like he's doubling and tripling down on that. You think that might kick off something more serious? Why is everybody in such a hurry for World War III ex- exactly? I feel like he may just be posturing because his position is pretty weak. No one Good. likes him. I think he might Praise be. I, th- God. I think he's just You're ra- saying there's rattling hope for the saber. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, but no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the French monarch is just uh, shaking his head right yeah. now. He's like, what? There's always hope for France. Tragic burden? There's, just, there's hope for come all of Come on, there's man. Hope, the eldest daughter of, of the church? Of course there's hope there's for ho- her. There's hope for all of Christendom. Please no spoilers on Cabrini, Robert says. All right, you guys ready for my take on Cabrini? Spoiler alert, she gets canonized. Spoiler. She gets canonized. <laughs> okay, that actually does happen at the end of the film, like, but not in the. Okay, that's yeah. just they're just newsreel. It was a newsreel during the credits, so I still okay, didn't nice. spoil anything. Okay, go. no spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers. The post, but it's the post credit scene. If you don't want to hear what I'm about to say, hit that mute button twice, right now, just to make sure. Just to make sure. Karen says, "Try Himalaya brand uh, recipe care." It's all natural and really helps stuffiness. Amazon sells it. I'll check it out. Thanks for doing it. All right. So, yeah. So, my wife and I got to go see uh, Cabrini. And there, the, it. Okay. Cliff Notes version. I recommend the film. I do recommend the film. I absolutely, you ought to go see it. You ought to, you ought to go see it. There's good, there's some great things to say about this film. There's also some downsides. I'm going to be honest with you. So, um, and it will be very much different than our conversation with Adrian Fonseca from American Eats Fatima the other day. So that video got posted yesterday. Uh, nobody's watched it yet. So you should watch it today and just uh, help give it some love. But nonetheless, so this film is beautifully made. Man, the cinematography was so good. Talk about CGI, right? So we were talking about to Simone uh, Delacre a minute ago about all of his CGI. He did Simone did a great job on that, and he did it like on a shoestring budget at his house, and it is very good, very good. You should check it out. So Cabrini's um, CGI is, is Hollywood best of the best level. They recreated New York in computer, and you believe it. They filmed the practicals in, of all places, Buffalo, New York, right in the backyard. In fact, Trad Jack Burton's sister was a part of the production staff. Mm -hmm. We interviewed her last year about her experience on set, which had to have been an incredibly cool experience to be on the set of a Hollywood film. So the cinematography, fantastic, beautiful. And Adrian said it well, every frame is a painting, it is. You want to pause. You want to take it in. The light. I I, I pay attention to how light is used. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I there's a there's a guy called the Wandering DP. He's got a YouTube channel, and ninety nine point nine 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 percent of everything he ever talks about is all about light. How to light a scene. How to light characters. How to light film. How to light commercials. How and he'll analyze movies. He'll analyze commercials based on light. Man, Alejandro, whoever you, whoever your grip was, whoever your cinematographer was, I mean, you just fantastic, so good, 
from a visual perspective, this movie is beautiful. From an acting perspective, the movie is fantastic. You know, the key actors are, I mean, the lady who plays Cabrini is great. She did a fantastic job in acting. I mean, you believe it. You believe, you believe you're there. Reality is, is suspended and you believe you are watching uh, this woman go through these things. She did a great job in acting. And of course, having some heavy hitters like Lithgow and the team really helps that, right? Mm. There's some supporting roles that are maybe not as good, good of acting, but the lady who, who, uh, who plays Victoria, who is the prostitute in the film, an excellent actor as well. Great job. So the acting is great. The film is beautiful. Sound design was wonderful. Um, the, the storytelling itself is incredible. It's good. It's very good. The storytelling is very good. So from all of those perspectives, this is an excellent film. But Joe, it's not Catholic enough. <laughs> okay, you know how much pushback I got for criticizing Father Stu? I got a lot of pushback for, fa- for criticizing Father Stu. <laughs> Uh, because I, I didn't like all the f bombs, yeah, right. you know. I didn't like the language. I just didn't. But Joe, it's a good Catholic film. Yeah. It's about a priest. It must be Catholic, you know. And hey, and I also, by the way, hats off to Sony for hearing the criticisms of the audience and doing something about it. Mm-hmm. Like they re-edited the film to make it more friendly, less curse. You know, I mean. Wahlberg's from Boston. He doesn't even know he's cursing. It's just the, li- <laughs> that's, it's that's just just the accent. That's it's just, just, just the Bostonian. accent. Yeah, he can't help himself. Mel Gibson can't help himself either. I mean, it's just their <laughs> accent, right? I mean, it's like, good grief. Have you spent a day in Boston? Forget about it. Okay? Forget about it. That's New York, Joe. Have you been to the north end of Boston? Okay, yeah. Are you- that's, that's close. I mean, it's close ma- I, maybe they're in the is, same place. It is hard to distinguish sometimes. Yeah, maybe they're in the same place, <laughs> but like, good grief. It's actually, I, don't I, know. I would say New Jersey is the one that has a monopoly on on forget about it. I, that's that's Jersey. Hey, forget about, forget it. about it. Forget about it. Forget about anyway, it. You we, know, we digress as usual. Uh, oh, yeah, is it digress or digress? I digress, but I was using the Latin. Pronunciation. You're digressing. I was the using digress. the Latin pronunciation hey, of the. I. Hey, hey. D- Irregardless. Digress- of your your pronunciation of, digressum. of, of digression, but not anyway. Wrap digressum it all. nobis. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, what was I say? Okay. So <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Okay. Mark Wahlberg and his South Boston accent aside, tons of Catholics would go watch that and have no problem with it. Tons of Catholics are going to go watch The Chosen, or or maybe films that are. More, have a, a greater weight on Catholicity, but their production values aren't even close. And all I'm saying is this film is a fabulous film that has flaws. And the flaw that I'm going to bring up most is not the one you're thinking about. So some of the flaws that Adrian brought up were he was, a, he, he got, he felt it was a little tinge cringe on some of the lines of I am woman. I didn't have a problem with any of those lines. Not one problem. She was a strong-willed woman. In reality, she was a strong-willed woman who lived in, in a world and in a time where, um, you know, you either had you had to be get her done. It had to be get her done Tuesday, or nothing got done. And she got things done in a world that didn't want her to get things done. So I didn't have a problem with any of those lines. And here's why I didn't have a problem with it: because at no time did her character burn her bra down. You know, like like in the '60s sexual revolution. At no, do- at no time did she destroy rightful authority or, or disrespect the rightful authority. At no time did she do this in the film. She always respects the authority of the Pope, of her bishop, of even the mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor in New York City. Her character in this film, and we know that there's like composite characters and obviously, you know, ho- you know Hollywood likes to you know, composite things and stretch, stretch things and place things in, you know, in, in, in characters that don't actually happen if they're based on real people. I mean, putting that to aside, the character of Cabrini in this film at no time disrespects the Pope, the Bishop, the mayor, or otherwise. Disagrees? Yes, sometimes. Yes, 100%. That's true. But doesn't disrespect them, even if she's being put in her place. 
Like that is a that's so that's that's an anti wokeism. That's an anti feminism. That uh, that's that I, I said I don't. I, in other words, my my point being, I didn't have any problem with any of those uh, "I am woman" statements. I thought they were perfectly fine. I saw them in the context in with which they were said, and I had no issues whatsoever with it at all. Not a South Boston accent. He's from Dorchester. Dorchester. I know Laura. I know he's from. From Dorchester. Dorchester Heights, by the way. By the way, pop quiz. Who built, who made it possible to rain down cannon fire on the British soldiers in Boston from Dorchester Heights? You're going to say George Washington. That's actually not true. Let's see who gets the right answer. Try Jack Burton, do you know? Who's the guy who's responsible for making that happen under the command of General George Washington? And if I'm not mistaken, he was a Catholic. I'm casting my mind back. Mm-hmm. Luke Skywalker says, Colin, we all know Luke is a lost cause. Getting drunk on cow milk on some strange island off the coast of Ireland. Uh, Disney, and like Disney, the other Disney. Irish, he's become pagan. So let's just move on. Alberto says, Paul Revere. No, fascinating <laughs> fact is not true. It's definitely I'm casting my, true. I can actually, I'm picturing in my mind the page on the book. Dorchester Heights. Kid, the, the, the section about Dorchester Heights. I'm trying to remember who such what a his cool name story was. though. Yeah, it is. I'm trying they, to remember his name. They staged, they they built all of the works, the fortifications behind the 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 heights where they were undercover, nobody could see them, and they had to do so as quietly as possible. And then they they hauled them all up the mountain and set them in place so that by dawn everything was ready and the British never saw it coming. It was a genius move. Yes, they, they woke up. They, they, it describes them waking up and like shocked. They see guns looking over them from the heights and yeah. they had to evacuate. I can't yeah. remember the guy's name though. Um, uh, not Mel Gibson, Alberto. <laughs> Definitely. I'm going to go on a limb here and say not Mel Gibson. All right. Uh, you got snow this morning. KSW. What? Uh, Maria Lupini says the chosen is fun to watch, but so not Catholic. Yeah, I'm gonna double. I'm gonna go ahead and double on that one. Yeah, so definitely, de- absolutely not Catholic. 100 percent not Catholic. Um. Oh, okay. I was, okay, I was my mind is getting lost. I have yeah. ne- had what? no sleep. No sleep. Did so, you reveal any, his name? Did anyone get it? I haven't. No, I okay. have not revealed okay. it. Uh, Master Baker says Knox. Uh, Laura's on the team for Knox. Is it Knox? And is Knox Catholic? Can you look that up for me? Uh, Trad Jack Burton. Um, Samuel Adams. Definitely not Samuel Adams. He was too much of a uh, troublemaker. And he really was a troublemaker. Oh, boy, was he ever a troublemaker. I spent my 2020 uh, lockdown. When we got locked down, I spent my 2020 uh, going over the Boston Massacre and reading and going through uh, original sort newspaper articles of the time and going through John Adams bios and then watching the HBO series and all of that. So Sam Adams is not high on my list of cool people. He was more trouble than he was worth, in my opinion. As far as I can tell, uh, Knox was not Catholic. Not Catholic. General Patton, says Carl Thomas. <laughs> that would have been cool. That and I'm sure neat. the pagan that he was probably thought he was there anyway, is reincarnated. Time, time, time traveling uh, General Patton. Time that's, that's 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 an '80s show wait, waiting to happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that was called uh, Quantum Leap. What are yeah, you talking exactly. about, bro? Yeah. That was Patton Quantum Leap. Leap. There we go. Uh, I loved Quantum Leap. <laughs> I enjoyed <laughs> Quantum Leap a lot. Anyway, can I repeat the question? I'm getting I'm going down a rabbit hole. I need to finish my point on Cabrini. Okay, yes. so I, I had no issues with the "I Am Woman" roar in the film. I didn't. Perfectly fine, in my opinion. The context was fantastic. I had no issues with the one curse word. The context was perfectly fine. Although I have heard from an inside source that that uh, that they wanted to edit that out or whatever, but it was like the, they they it was required for it to stay by certain partners in the pro, on the program. I don't know. One of my one of my questions is in partnering with say uh, Angel Studios, did they require any editing? Did they add? Did they edit out any Catholicism? I don't know the answer to that. It's pure speculation. It's just a question on my mind. I don't know. I have no idea. But the question is coming up. So let's talk about some of the downsides. There is definitely a tinge. I'm going to say it this way: there is a tinge of Catholic light. There is a missed opportunity here. I, I, I 100% agree. There's a missed opportunity 
they should have had, you know, they should have had a mass depicted in this film. At the very least, they should have had a mass depicted. Here's one of the good things about what was depicted. There was one scene, there's two churches uh, depicted, the insides of churches depicted in the film, as far as I can, as far as, far as I remember. Both traditional Latin mass ad orientum altars. No Nova Sordo altars. Period. Correct. Well done. I have seen films that depict history that they include the Nova Sordo altar, which is bizarre. It just like all of a sudden you're 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 ripped from the story and you're put back into this weird reality situation. So in this film, they definitely were careful to not depict a Nova Sordo altar in a time that would that would not have existed. Clearly, our forefathers uh, all faced liturgically east during during worship of God. To include, by the way, go back to the Israelites. The Israelites uh, worshipped ad orientum towards the liturgical east. In fact, there's an, there is a ar- archaeological evidence to even back that up. I've talked about that in the past. It's fascinating. Ad orientum. Make it great again. That's what I say. So there is a missed opportunity in this film to have depicted the beauty of the traditional Latin mass. It would have been incredible. It would have been beautiful. It would have been appropriate. And, you know, and again, this is this is a flaw. This is a downside. And I 100% agree with it. And let me give you a contrast to that. Talk about South Boston. Talk about Dorchester, South Boston. Hey, forget about it. I know the Italians come from the north, but I can't, I'm, I haven't slept, so I can't really do the accent all that well. Uh, Boondock Saints. Who remembers the Boondock Saints film? What was that called? <laughs> it's called Boondock Saints. Was it called? Uh, like I, did I get, get, I get that right? Boondock Saints. Remember yeah, the Boondock, Boondock Saints? Saints? The mass was depicted in that film. So just a, as a comparison, like I think, you know, if the Boondock Saints, if you're going to depict the Holy Mass and the Boondock Saints, but not in Cabrini, mm-hmm. like clearly that's a problem. That, okay, that's a problem. I, I think we can admit that. However... I got to say, because of, of certain uh, of certain opinions about this film, predetermined opinions about the film, <laughs> um, you know, saying it's not Catholic enough, it's not Catholic enough. I th- I believe that that woman was sold out for Jesus Christ and for the truth. Her life was totally sh- believable on film. Like mm. the 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 actress, her acting, her storytelling, her. Me, uh, me, and in, like interpreting that in light of of her actual words spoken on film and her her behavior and actions, she repeatedly draws us closer to God throughout the entire film. It's there's not it's not even a question. She um she she speaks of God. She speaks of her total devotion to God and living her her life. And there's a there's a, a phrase. This is a spoiler, but there's a phrase that she says to the Holy Father. So if you don't want to hear what I'm about to say, smash the mute button twice, just to be sure. She says to the Holy Father, one can serve one's weaknesses or one's mission. You can't do both. And that's not an, an implicit, it's, or not, it's not explicit, it's implicit. There's way more um, explicit references to God in particular and to her love for the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, but man, was that like a power that, that hit me? That was a powerful, powerful phrase. I would say that dare I say that even affirmed me that that, that encouraged me because I tend to be the Debbie Downer, the pessimist, the glass half full guy. I tend to see my weaknesses, and um, I found that I found that very encouraging because the world was not big enough for her. I, it was a powerful scene. I don't want to spoil it beyond that. It's a powerful scene. So, yes, missed opportunity to be more beautifully Catholic, not just Catholic. Having a mass said in the background that's not focused on would not have been what I would have wanted. That would have been okay, but no. The missed opportunity in a film made so beautifully as this one was would have been a traditional Latin mass at the high altar, smells and bells, Gregorian chant, you know, that is the missed opportunity because that would have been beautiful. That would have been gorgeous. And it would have fit perfectly into a film made beautifully. I, I would so, say I, I wanted to I want to interject here with something that's like I think this is kind of 
this should be, and, and this is a, a mistake that a lot of us make just in general in treating the saints, is that we, we, we make it all about the things they did out in the world. And you, well, it, well, like, this no, one here's, doesn't here's the thing. Yeah, no, I'm, quite I, I'm, stoop to that level. No, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's what Cabrini did. I'm, I'm trusting your take on it like in that way. But what I'm saying is like, if you really want to show what makes a saint do the great things they do out in the world, because it's important, it's important to show what they did. That's important. Like a film, a film that was all about a saint who was just a contemplative nun. It might be fascinating. Or what's that documentary? Uh, Into Into Great Silence about yeah. the, the the monks. Like yeah. that, that's interesting. But you know, if you're making an entertaining movie, you want to make an entertaining movie about what a saint did and a cool story. I feel like you, you for for future filmmakers who are making this, you have to at least once show them getting the spiritual energy and fuel of I, I don't con- contemplation, the mass adoration, yeah. something like that. And um, yeah. who was it? Um, was it Studebaker Hawk said, yeah, his his criticism, his big Cabrini criticism was you never saw her actually praying. You had to, assu- uh, that's you had not to true. assume she was praying that's actually, elsewhere. That's, Is that not true? It's actually not true. Okay. Uh, I, I distinctly, I mean, because I, I picked up on that last night. There is a scene, there's at least one, uh, there may be even more, but there's at least one for sure where I know she was praying. Okay, good. Um, good. Yeah, but it, it's, it's still subtle. So the argument yeah, is yeah, yeah. it could be better. Like I And I agree. I agree yeah. with this argument. I I do see that it could be better. I think where I differ is I'm not willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> There's a lot of great in this film. It's a fabulous film with some flaws. But but this isn't even one of my biggest flaws. I mean, or that's – um. Hmm, uh, I should probably be careful how I say that. Is it, that that's a big one. But there is another issue that no one's talking about. Maybe others are talking about, but like in the circles that I've been running, haven't heard much talk about it that I'm actually concerned about. And it ain't the I am woman, hear me roar uh, lines. Again, I had zero problem with those lines. Perfectly fine in the context that I saw them. And I think there's a missed opportunity in being more explicitly Catholic because the beauty was there. So what an opportunity to plant the seeds of beauty, goodness, and truth in the divine liturgy that gives proper worship to God. Like, pff, missed opportunity, to say the least. Um, I loved the many, many little uh, elements in the, that were in the background uh, of the Catholic faith. An altar, uh, images of the Sacred Heart, of Our Lady, of St. Joseph. It, you can, you just... It's like whenever whenever I walk in, like for instance, I was hanging out at Fatima Farm uh, last Friday. One week from one week from today, I was with the Fatima Farm crew out in, in Georgia. You walk into their house and you look around, and there's a billion little details of their Catholic faith. And I just loved. It's like it's like the Where's Waldo picture. You know, it's kind of like that. Like you're just looking for those hidden gems because they're they're everywhere, and you're everywhere your eye looks, it falls upon something interesting and beautiful and. And uh, and just stands out. Like, I love doing that when I walk into a Catholic home. I like finding those details. I like looking at them and seeing their artwork, their iconography, their statuary, their books. I mean, Fatima Farm, fantastic example of that. This, there was, in this film, in the background, you'll see those things throughout the whole film. I thought that was beautiful. I thought it was awesome. Again, could have been better, could have been more. I do agree. But there is one thing. There's one thing, and I might, might need a few more minutes on the clock here, Jake. I was already already planning on it. <laughs> already all over it. That's why you're a good producer. That's why you're good at what you do. Um, there was one thing that nobody's talking about. The immigration issue. This is a film about Italian immigrants at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when they came over in huge numbers. And like the Irish before them, like the like the the Eastern Europeans, Polish, Germans, Hungarians, uh, the Slavic peoples before them, like uh, so many before them, like even even my own heritage of uh, Scotch Irish, the the um, you know the um, Scotsmen who came over after the Battle of Culloden and the Irish, the Ulster Scots that came over, they became white trash, the Appalachian the Appalachian white trash, yeah. Um, they weren't treated well either. Immigrants don't tend to be treated well when they come in. I mean, when, when, when the immigrants came in for the colonies, think about the immigrants, the Puritan immigrants. Think about the English immigrants, the Spanish immigrants. When they came over, 
Did the current inhabitants of North America treat them well? Some yes, but a lot no. It's the story of immigration, right? When the Mongolian horde, the Golden Horde, started to push uh, westward, what did the barbarians do? They started to push westward into the Roman Empire. So it was a cascading effect. How did that go? What did the barbarians really, really, really want? What did they ask for? They asked for citizenship in the Roman Empire, for protection, to become a member of the community. And then when Rome said, mm, no, nope. no, nah, sorry, no. Nah. Tell you what, though, you can serve in our legions. You can die for the cause, but you can't be citizens. How'd that go? Well, it didn't go well because the barbarians are like, you know what? I think we're just going to take it for ourselves anyway. And that's exactly what they did. Only they got Aryan trained and not Christian trained. So, you know, burning churches was a part of that process because there was, a, there was an element there of heresy involved at the same time of survival, at the same time of greed and opportunity. So the story of humanity is the story of immigration. In this film, there was a, like a little voice in the back of my head was like, is there an agenda here in a, t in, a, in a time in a time where we are seeing a mass migration crisis on a global scale? Europe, North America, we're suffering from the same things right now. Mass migration on a global scale. Are we, is somebody wagging their finger at us? You racists, you, you immigrant haters, you need to be more Cabrini-like and love everybody. Something, it was just a little, because like the whole immig immigrant, immigration, you treat them poorly, you hate them. There's the name calling, you know, in the film and, you know, and it just, it made me wonder. So I didn't, my, I didn't have spidey senses raised against the feminist issue. No, nope, sorry. She was just a strong Catholic woman. Like St. Hildegard was a strong Catholic woman. St. Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa of Avila. This is a strong Catholic. Was Joan of Arc, strong Catholic woman. I see Cabrini in the same vein. Had no issues with those lines whatsoever. Do I want to see more a stronger uh, depiction of especially the traditional Latin mass in this film? Absolutely, because that was the mass Cabrini went to and loved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would, I would have liked to have seen that. But it was the immigration issue. I was like, hmm, is that the agenda here? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it was just the timing of it. Maybe it's just the timing of it. But we've had an immigration crisis for now a long time. And I did wonder about that. Let me know what your thoughts are on that issue. And if you've heard anybody else talk about that point, let me know. One of my friends noticed that too. What was their, what did they say? Uh, they, they didn't elaborate too much on it, but they basically said like, you know, it was it took us uh, a social justice -y angle on that, you know, not, not yeah. in, in not necessarily a Catholic social teaching way, but in a like, uh, oh, look at these evil Americans being racist against the Italians, which, yes, that happened, but that they were framing it not as like a as a as also an anti-Catholic thing. They were framing it too much as just a look at the look. If you're opposed to immigration, you're an evil racist type of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Carl brings up a great point here. Protestants give immigrating Catholics a rough time. Mm -hmm. On my shelf, uh, over there somewhere, too far for me to reach, uh, especially with a bad arm, um, is uh, is the Bishop of Baltimore from the 19th century, The Church, the Liberty, and Culture. And it is a fantastic read. And um, I think he wrote it in the 1880s, if I'm not mistaken. And um, the first chapter alone is like prophecy. It's like reading our time, almost. And it's a hammer. It's a sledgehammer. The book is a sledgehammer <laughs> against the Protestant country, Protestant United States, which is part of the reason why I, I wanted to talk to Sam McCarthy today about his article, because, again, I see these commentators going from a bad uh, opinion to an even worse one. <laughs> so, I mean, like, that's what we're dealing with. It, when that book was written, The Church, Liberty, and Culture, I'm looking at the wrong camera. I have not slept. Can you tell? Um, I should be looking over here. Uh, the Church, Liberty, and Culture 
the party of the know nothings was a big deal. Uh, they were burning churches, tar and feathering priests and nuns. They were harassing and intimidating Catholics all the time. And that bishop was like laying at the foot of the Protestant revolution, all of the world's evils. And that is a big deal. That is why the immigration uh, issue is not the same as the one we're dealing with today. The Italian immigrants came here legally in droves, in huge numbers, millions came across that Atlantic Ocean on boats, but they came through they came through the, the, the door and the gate legally. Now, maybe it was very lax. Maybe there was like no pushing anybody back. Uh, you know, that, there, there might be an argument, but nonetheless, they came through legally. And they were um, not that welcomed into this society, just like the immigrants before them were not that welcome, just like the immigrants before them were not that welcome. But over time, that changes, and they, and they integrate, and they become a part of the fabric of society. So, but the immigration crisis we're facing now is is definitely not the same. By the way, I'm going through the book uh, Dagger John, which I have a copy of it. Actually, my son stole it. It's in his room. <laughs> um, but I'm going through the audiobook version of it anyway, of Dagger John, who was the Archbishop, Archbishop Hughes. His nickname was Dagger John during this American Civil War or the War Between the States. And, um, and when he was Archbishop of New York, very complicated character, by the way, he went and recruited boatloads of Irishmen to fight and die at the cannons during the war. And he had to go across Europe trying to win and curry favor away from the Confederacy because so many European countries had sympathies for the Confederacy, to include the Vatican, by the way. But nonetheless, um, Dagger John basically went and threatened the mayor of New York because he was a member of the party, the Know Nothings, and they were fond of burning and destroying uh, Catholic parishes across our country. And Dagger John's like, listen, this is how it's going to go down, okay? Are you listening, buddy? You paying attention? You need to be paying attention. I'll speak slowly, boy, so you can hear me. If you touch one single parish, we're coming out in the streets, and it ain't going to be fun. Never touched a single church in New York City. <laughs> like, that's how you get that done. Spoiler alert, in Cabrini, there's kind of something similar. <clears throat> is a, a vague hint, a vague hint, a vague hint. Um, so for all of Dagger John's foibles, and there were some to be said for sure, at least as the archbishop, he stood up for the Catholic faith and the Catholic faithful in the, in the Archdiocese of New York City, and he said, oh, no, you're not going to be doing this today. Not on my watch. I mean, I would say, wouldn't you say, uh, Trajack Burton, that's eerily similar to the current occupant of the cathedra in New York City, who, uh, I mean, just the other day, at a show of great courage and boldness, uh, it, you know, asked everybody to enjoy Ramadan. You know, like, to get along with their... Muslim brothers and sisters. Very eerily similar. Some would argue like almost the same as Dagger John's courage. courage. Anyway, I digress. So my bottom line on Cabrini. My bottom line on Cabrini is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't want to go watch it? Don't go watch it. That's fine. But as for me and my house, it was a great film. Fabulous, beautiful, good storytelling film. And it depicted Cabrini as being a great woman of faith who would spend every waking moment of her life doing something amazing and incredible, even if there were in difficult challenges that would try to stop her. And at no time did she lose respect for, uh, for the authority, the rightful authority placed over her. She tried to work within the bounds. She tried to find every opportunity, every loophole. To be sure, but this is a woman who in real life accomplished amazing things. And you're never going to do that unless you are you have sheer de determination. And I absolutely love that line. You can serve your weakness or you can serve your purpose. You can't do both. You got to pick. I was very encouraged by this film. I thought it was beautiful. I would encourage you to watch it. If you don't want to go watch it, that's fine. That's your call. I just but, think I would think we need a, a sequel about uh, now St. John Baptist Scalabrini and the missionaries of St. Charles Borromeo, because then they could film again in Buffalo, because 
my parish was started by the Scalabrini fathers, but uh, Father Morelli apparently once wrote to Bishop Scalabrini in 1888, if we do not quickly establish kindergartens and schools to prevent our children from falling into Protestant hands, the future of our community, its faith and natural character will be destroyed. I think we need a little more of that in uh, in our movies about Italian immigrants. <laughs> there you go. We need a little more of uh, of that attitude. Salvation yeah. of souls. Salvation so, of souls. Salvation of I souls agree. and preservation of the faith. Well, she definitely communicated that. It wasn't just... It wasn't, it wasn't just, just about. It wasn't just uh, feed about, them, feed them, feed them. It was. It wasn't just about that. That's good, for sure. Good. But now that's there's that's strong in the film. Let's not kid ourselves. It's definitely very strong. Good. But it wasn't only that for sure. Yeah. For sure, it wasn't only that. Um, I, I there was a character in the film that was utterly disappointing. Might have been wearing a little collar right there. I I. Oh, I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to like, I don't want to like throw too many spoilers. But I was really disappointed in that character. Did they did they not do justice to Pope Leo the Thirteenth, who's one of my favorite popes? They did. They did. They did. Yeah. Good. I, Good for them. I thought it was. Those were some of my favorite scenes. Good. Yeah. I love Pope Leo. I, again, I, yeah. I, I I know Carl uh, Carl doesn't like me throwing the baby out with the bathwater <laughs> sentence, but. My friend, it's uh, it's a great figure of speech to use for this for this case. I don't know the origin of it, but um, yeah, I guess I can, can we uh, can we put baby yeah. baby in the bathwater on the mug and uh, mm. canary in the coal mine? Canary and, in the coal yeah. mine. <laughs> yeah, Feels for sure. Like a canary in a coal mine. Oh man, how's that song go? I can't remember the the. It just I remember the that one line from the chorus. It's not my favorite police song, but yeah, I mean the film also the film also you know depicts the, the the difficult days of yesteryear we always tend to think of our times as being the hardest times and i think we can underappreciate the difficulties and challenges of our brothers and sisters in christ who have gone before us and had to deal with so much and that is definitely one of the the themes in the cabrini is um the hierarchy and dealing with certain political situations and you know especially there in new york and what they did or didn't do to to deal with that you know so uh, I don't want to spoil again. I don't want to spoil everything by giving it all away, but I, I, I'm telling you, this this movie's beautiful, and I would recommend seeing it. Uh, Janice, good morning to you. Says we became a country because of immigration, immigrant, immigrant, immigration, and immigration. No, immigration and migration. Sorry. Uh, true. Today it's much different. We are now the USA, uh, but we have laws for those who come here to make a better life. That's the point I made earlier. That's what's that's one of the things that is vastly different between the circumstances of this film and what it depicts from the 19th century and our day to day. You're not only seeing mass migration of an illegal kind, but of a nefarious one. And that's also different. There's nefarious actors who are propelling the illegal component to it. They have an agenda and they are trying to um they are trying to see that through, and they are providing the material resources to push these migrants at a higher scale, right? At a at a at a ten x. Like that's not good. That's bad. As a country, we as ca- as a Catholic, uh, I do have sympathy for the for the migrant. We cannot allow ourselves and our hearts to. Um, to stop caring about the plight of our neighbor, of our friends. We must be the good Samaritan. Absolutely, we will be judged on how we live our life, and we are expected to perform corporal works of mercy, no matter uh, who that person is that has that need. We believe that. And yet, we also believe as Catholics that we have a right, a natural law right, to defend ourselves, Mm -hmm. to have law and order. I mean, the problem is we're being told you have to choose this or that. It's either you you either care about the plight of the immigrant or you're an evil conservative Republican who wants to just build borders and reject, you know, and you're a racist who hates all these people. Like, no, I reject those those uh, solutions, those options. Sorry, but no, I'm a Catholic. I do care about the plight of my neighbor. I do care about the plight of immigrants. I don't want them to be giving thousands of hard-earned donor do- or do- dollars that they had to scrape together to pay a coyote to come across that border who might – enslave them, rape them, or murder them, force them to 
pack mule drugs across the border or worse? Absolutely. I, I, that, the, the, what, what about the plight of the immigrant families that get caught up in that mess? And the myriad and myriad, thousands of stories of, of women, young women and boys who've been molested on that border and never seen or heard from again. I care about the plight of those people. I care about the fact that criminals are coming across that border and committing grave crimes here. They shouldn't be committing grave crimes back home, and they ought not to be doing it here either. And we have a we have a solemn duty and obligation, or at least our elected officials have a solemn duty and obligation to protect the citizens of this country against such criminal element. But they want open borders. That's become clear. I mean, they, Obama talked about it all the time during his reign. And now it's being talked about more in a more clandestine way. In fact, James O'Keefe had an undercover video just the other day of a Pentagon official talking about open borders. They've wanted open borders for decades now, and they're getting it. They're pushed, they're ramrodding it through. That is not the same thing. We, what we want is to care about the plight of others and do so responsibly, ethically, morally. We want immigration, immigration legally. We don't want, uh, we don't want to, close the country off and say no to immigrants because we are a country of immigrants and the world history is a history of immigration. So we don't reject that. We reject the illegal immigration, the, the woefully crime ridden and woefully agendized immigration of the global elites. That's what we reject. Here's, so, here's the analogy I, I, I think is useful to think about. Let's say you have a family and maybe Maybe your family is majority like adopted kids, you know, um, who you welcomed in to your family to to form your household. You have an obligation to that family first. And now, obviously, if a bunch of people break into your house illegally, that's bad, right? Nobody, nobody should support that. And you have no obligation to to, you know, be welcoming to invaders. Um, let's say that you invite someone in. Let's say you invite a homeless person in and take care of them. Okay, that's great. What happens if you just keep inviting legally homeless people into your house to take care of them? At what point are you doing a disservice to your existing family and household? And at what yeah. point does your house just become basically a big slum instead of an actual house for your family? As, yeah. as a Catholic, you have yeah. a solemn obligation to your family first. Right. Yeah, you're, you're right. That's, 100%. That's, that's how that works. So use that. Yeah. That's the analogy you have to apply yeah. to your country and your nation, even if you, even yeah. if your nation was originally founded that's by true. Italian, Irish, immigrant, whatever you want to say. It's funny you say that. Because that's not I, a justification you, even for unending legal immigration. It really is. You isn't. just reminded me. I gave a, I gave a talk to uh, – I, I, I used to speak publicly, believe it or not. It used to be a thing I used to do. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be doing it next month in Florida, I think. I think I'm, going to be using, I'm probably going to be using one of those for Holy, Holy uh, Thursday's uh, Encore episode, too. So. You just reminded me. Um, I gave a talk to the staff of a parish uh, at, at a particular parish not far from me. This was years ago. And I kind of made that point. I talked about how when Jesus calls us to, you know, in uh, in the judgment scene, you know, in the sheeps and the goats, and did you visit me? Did you feed me? Did you clothe me? Uh, did you care for me? When did we? When did we not uh, care for you or see for you? Blah blah blah. And uh, so I went through all that, and then I made the point of: Are you doing that in your own house first and foremost? And almost, I mean, most of these Catholics never think this way. They never, mm -hmm. they never. Like, what, what do you mean? Like, when when you say, "Did you visit the in prison?" They think of prisoners in a, in a prison. They think of strangers. They think of homeless people on the street. They think of you know naked and sick people and. Uh, that there are complete strangers. And I'm like, well, did you do it for your your house first? Mm -hmm. You can't step over your own friends and your own family, your own loved ones to care for a stranger and ignore your own house. Like your house has to come first. Get your house in order first. And then you can, yes. you know, go out and help the stranger. So to make your point, I mean, you just reminded me of that. And that's so true. It's so true. Matthias is asking deep, profound philosophical questions this morning, apparently. I mean, I didn't get any sleep, and apparently Mateus hasn't either, because he's asking, Dawson schools are taught by her heretics these days. Okay, that's not what he's asking. He's asking, 
the best immigrant movie ever. Gangs of New York, Far and Away, or Cabrini. Those are the only three we get to choose from? Yeah, seriously. Dances with Wolves wasn't one of them? Uh, what was the what was the um what was the live action Godfather film? Godfather 2? Godfather 2? I can hear the music in my head right now. Na, na, um, na, 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 now what was the uh, uh there was a Disney film about um Pocahontas? <laughs> wasn't there a, wasn't there like a live action film of folk? What are you laughing at? Over no, there? I, was just, I, was, I was I wasn't sure where you were going, and then you were like Pocahontas. Po, I, was, oh, I haven't funny. slept so remembering names I, and things. I, no, it like was it wasn't foggy. about the memory. It was just I wasn't expecting Pocahontas po, to be the Pocahontas. Next Pocahontas. Yeah, sure. Pocahontas was real, yeah. and wasn't she Catholic too? Um, like wasn't I, that's an immigration po, film? How po, come you didn't? Pocahontas is a movie about illegal immigration. <laughs> why didn't you? Why didn't you include those, Mateus? I'm just asking for a friend. Hey, uh, Gangs of New York. How many people watch Gangs of New York? Also about five points. I think that's a good comparison because both sort of are central around the same time period and around the same location, the five points region of New York City in the 19th century. And uh, and they both depict this chaotic world of immigrants bashing up against each other and mm -hmm. fighting for power, yep. right? Because that's, at the end of the day, that's all it is. Immigrants fighting immigrants over who gets to control and say what works. Um, but Gangs of New York, ultra gritty, ultra nasty, yeah. ultra hardcore. I couldn't, I, can't, I couldn't finish watching a Gangs of New York. I watched, like, it, I watched it once. I haven't watched it again. I, there's a lot of elements about it that I enjoyed from a filmmaking perspective. But it's, also, it's a very sloppy movie. I wanted to like, enjoy it because yeah. it had big names in it. <laughs> but, you know, the the, the, the language, the, the vulgarity of the language, yeah, the vulgarity of sexuality, the vulgarity of, of violence didn't accentuate the story. It made it worse, in my opinion. Even even if it was fairly accurate to how that was, you know, yeah. the savagery of that. But Right. Yeah. Whereas in Cabrini, they depict the world that the, the Gangs of New York also depicts in the same grittiness – they depict the violence, they depict the sexuality, they depict the vulgarities, but they do so uh, with uh, uh, with a lot less severity, with an intense amount less uh, of grittiness. Hmm. Yet you still get the point, <laughs> and yet you aren't bashed over the head with it. <clears throat> but Hollywood can't help themselves. They like I, I, everything has to be over the top all the time. We interrupt this plot line to bring you sexuality. Mm -hmm. We interrupt this plot line to bring you the F-bomb tirade. I'm sorry, that's just Mark Wahlberg's accent. Can't help himself. We interrupt this plot line to bring you violence. Now back to the story. Like, you didn't need to go there to, like... So is, is, is Mel Gibson as much to blame for his use of violence in Braveheart, which was a turning point in, in movie-making history? Was it Saving Private Ryan that did that? I would argue you wouldn't get a Saving Private Ryan unless you had a Braveheart first. What about, what about RoboCop? Good point. What about excellent what point? About the Wild Bunch. Excellent. Bon, Clockwork bon, Orange. Bonnie and Clyde. Clockwork Orange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how far do we got to go back? <laughs> like where? Okay. Gotta so go back to the Hayes Code. We got to bring back the Hayes Code. What's the thread? We're pulling on the thread. What was the first most uh, vulgar, violent film? That came out of Hollywood. What was it? Well, I don't know. You can go pre -haste, Far and Away. Let's talk about Far and Away. Far and Away. Uh, far and Away was a beautifully shot film. Epic, huge, massive, long. What was it, three, four hours? Mm. It was long. And... It was longer and, than Tom Cruise's tall... Okay, wait, maybe that's not... At awesome. least Tom Cruise tried to do an Irish accent. <laughs> I mean... Why did he not do the German thing when he played the German Catholic guy yeah, who Valkyrie. tried to murder murder Hitler? You had an opportunity and you wasted it. Shia LaBeouf, I'm thinking of you, bro. You're going to do Padre Pio? You look like the young Padre Pio. You missed a golden opportunity. You needed to do the accent. You took me out of the world. You, you, you take me out of the, that, that world when you just be you. I didn't come to watch Shia. I came to watch Padre. I didn't come to watch Tom Cruise. I came to watch the character Tom Cruise was playing. But at least in Far and Away, 
he has an accent and attempts it, right? I mean, like, hats off to him. And um, I don't know. I don't know about you. I liked Far and Away. No Catholic real element in that for a Catholic Irishman that picked it in the film. But I don't remember any Catholics complaining about it at the time. Who knows? Janice says, let's start a grassroots effort to support Joe McClain to make a movie. Oh, I want to pay other people to make movies. <laughs> I want to be the wizard behind the curtain. That's what I want to do. Oh, yeah. What, what I wouldn't do with George Soros money. Patricia says, Joe, Joe made a great movie last year. A great documentary film, and I want to make more. I definitely want to make more doc, doc films. And I'm trying to release my, my CRS, uh, Catholic Relief Services, expose today. Thank you, Janice. You're you're too amazing. If you win the lottery, look us up and let us know. What we have plans for at the Station of the Cross is big, 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 big. But we need we need big money. Uh, Simone needed a million dollars to make his next release. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a big deal. And imagine if we had an Angel Studios Guild. Like, what if? Imagine for a second if we had the Guild Angel Studios has, but it's Catholic, supported by Catholics, and they would put their money up to to help Catholic creatives create amazing things. That's what we want to do over at the Station of the Cross. Sky Baker, good morning to you. Ooh, good one, Joe. Can't, uh, can't wait to, to watch your expose. Yeah. Well, you got to watch a little bit of it yesterday. I did mm-hmm. play a portion of it yesterday with um, Steve Mosier, but there's more on the hook for sure. Maria Lupini, good morning to you. Scribbler, you might be correct. Did this order of nun not wear a crucifix? She wore, oh yeah, that was definitely something for sure. Cabrini was wearing a plain cross. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. That was, did catch my eye. I'd, Thanks I'd for love bringing to, that I'd love up. to know because there are. I'm sure there are some orders out there that just wear a plain cross for whatever reason, but yeah. Well, at least they yeah. do today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did yeah. they back then? Uh, That's the thing. I, w- I would have thought they would have a. Full yeah, six. I mean, I, I I agree that I believe is problematic. I do agree with that. But am I willing to not go watch the movie because of it? Nope. It was still a good film. Well, it's kind of it's kind of a uh, a microcosm of of America and Catholicism. It's like it's so you can you can have your Catholicism if it's kind of blurred and in the background. But yeah, don't but, make but, it the first thing. Otherwise, no one this, will go see it. No, I, get, I this, get it. I get it. It's just. But I'm, this is why I say if I had George Soros' money, yes, yes. I would create an environment in which Alejandro uh, Monteverde, who's clearly one of the most capable filmmakers of our time, mm-hmm. could do so with an even greater grandeur and beauty. Yes. Unfortunately for him, and all of our backseat quarterbacking and all this conversation, unfortunately for him, there exists nothing like that for him. Yep. Unless you have George Soros' money or Mel Gibson's money. Mel Gibson funded his own effort because nobody else would. Mm-hmm. Um, all we have is the Mormons, and the Mormons come with strings attached. So the Catholic faithful need to all get together, and they need to put their money into a giant pot, and they need to support Catholic filmmakers so that they have the freedom and flexibility to create beauty, grandeur, epic storytelling, plus the beauty of, of, of traditional Catholic faith. And Mel Gibson, the, Mel Gibson made that money by essentially selling his soul to Hollywood, you know, and, and God how willing, many he gets films, it back, but still. And I don't want to burn Mel down here. No, if I had a no. chance to interview Mel, I would be all, all over it in spades. Yeah, I mean, it would be an amazing opportunity. And be careful about meeting your heroes, right? Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, how many films has Mel made since The Passion of the Christ, which are cringy, super cringy? Talk about vi- violence porn. He did a Santa Claus violence porn film not long ago. Like, Mel, what are you doing, bro? Like, Apocalypto was great. Talk about gritty, hardcore. Oh, man, it was hard to watch that film. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Hard to watch. Yes. But Mel, if I could encourage you, make the 2.0 of that. Make the sequel. Make Hernan Cortez a little less violent, but depict it, right? Use good storytelling, good crafting storytelling to depict that world and tell that story. Use the power of imagination to suggest exactly. the violence. Exactly. Exactly. I just, I just rewatched an old uh, Sherlock Holmes film yet last night that it uses the suggestion of violence and yeah. to great effect. It makes it scarier and creepier and yeah it's great 
better. Yeah, Braveheart, Mel Gibson, William Wallace, supposedly a Catholic. Maybe the real William Wallace, who was Norman, really. Wasn't really a Scotsman, he was a Norman. Um, along with Bruce, Robert DeBruce is also Norman. Let that sink in, which just means Viking, by the way. It's just Vikings, the Northmen. It's, it's Vikings all the way down. Yeah, it's, it's really a Viking story. But nonetheless, would Catholics... So are, so are the Kievan Rus. <laughs> It's yeah, all, it's all Vikings just going around. Rabbit holes as the <laughs> as the clock ticks down on us yes. here. Hey, I guess the point I was going to make is the overindulgence in violence. Catholic warriors must sometimes fight and die for the cause and for justice and truth. They don't have to love it. They don't have to relish in it. They don't have to revel in it. They just got to do their deed. That's all. See you guys Monday. God love you.